Hey everyone, before we started, I just wanted to say three quick things. The first thing is that while we were recording this episode, James's audio dropped out. So while Jason and I could hear him just fine, he was not being recorded. So there's some weirdness when you get into the episode. It will be pretty apparent what happened. Number two is that I am doing a giveaway for the month of July. This was recorded before that, so the details will be at the very tail end after the outro music. And number three, we now have the play message boards up. Uh, So you can go to www.techahedron.com slash boards and join the conversation. Thanks, and let's get started. I'm Joe. And I'm James. And I'm Jason. And this is the Decahedron RPG Cast. Hi, James. Hi, Joe. I have a feeling that we are not alone. And what are you talking about? It's only me and you. No, I, I see somebody in the corner just lurking there. I've been here all along. Ah! <laughs> That's the voice of Jason from the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. He is joining us today because once upon a time, long time ago... He said something about Boot Hill, and I said, Boot Hill, that's not an RPG. And he said, well, certainly. And he sent me this article about people using Boot Hill to play an RPG. And in my mind, I was still like, just because you can use something to play, to role play, doesn't mean that it is a role playing game. So we came up with this idea to have Jason on the show. We invited him and he accepted. And today we're going to talk about what is an RPG and We also said that he was going to try to convince me that Boot Hill is an RPG, but I'm going to concede the point before we begin, because as part of my prep for the show, I actually brought up my old first edition Boot Hill, and I started looking through it, and I'm like, yeah, it's an RPG. What what was I thinking? And the only thing I can think of is once upon a time, because I haven't opened that book in years, uh, it's back when I was in Texas, we were going to start an Old West style campaign with my gaming group that I had there. And I looked at it I, and the cover, like the cover didn't even say role playing game. You know, it said rule for miniature combat in the Old West or something like that. And uh, of course, if you look at the original version of the white box for D&D, it doesn't mention role playing at all anywhere. The term hadn't been invented yet. And it, I think that the title is almost the same rules for medieval combat with miniature figures or something so um so yes i am conceding that point up front but the question is what is a role-playing game or what is it that makes a game a role-playing game versus a card game or a board game or whatever and i'm gonna let our guest go first what do you think jason i think and i did not come up with this definition i slightly modified it but this is i think as good a definition as definition as you'll get A tabletop role-playing game is a structured cooperative activity with predictable rules and unpredictable outcomes that takes place directly with other people where players are playing as characters they create in an open, interactive, responsive world facilitated by a game master. I'm going to ask a question there. Does it require a game master? Can you not have a cooperative game that fits there? That's a good question. And actually, I had sent an email to Joe before the show and mentioned I could see taking out a couple terms to make this solo friendly and cooperative friendly. So especially post COVID, where things like journaling games and all. So, so then we get into the murky waters, right? The first thing that made me chuckle was a cooperative activity because, you know, I remember those games as a teenager. They didn't seem cooperative at all. <laughs> um, it depended on your group. <laughs> yes, it did, James. <laughs> okay, James, so so give us your take. What do you think a role-playing game is versus any other game? To me, a role-playing game, and I'm going to steal someone else's term, theater of the mind. Um, it is a co-op or a, a game master, dungeon master, whatever term you want to use, is also acceptable. It is a game where people get together with some type of attention to do something. They may not even know what it is. 
Uh, so are you saying that the people themselves don't know or the characters that they're playing don't know? A little bit of both, <laughs> especially if you have a good DM. There are some games where the situation changes turn by turn as it stops or uh, goes from one person to another. They'll put their own little twist into the game. That's more a co-op than a Dungeons and Dragons or type game. All right. So, yeah, because we're going to talk about this, I, too, have been giving this much, much thought. And, you know, I was thinking, okay, Monopoly isn't a role-playing game. Dungeons and Dragons is. What's the difference? And then I said, let's let's make it even a little more, you know, a little more Apple-y to Apple-y. I'm like, Chainmail is not a role-playing game. Dungeons & Dragons is. So what is that leap from Chainmail to Dungeons & Dragons? And I think I think it's right there in the name. It's the role. You, you, you have a character, a persona that you are living through. But then I come to... Aren't you kind of doing that when you play Monopoly? Aren't you playing the role of a real estate tycoon? At this point, the gods of technology smote James and cursed him. Whilst he was still in the call, his voice was no longer being recorded. We shall continue with the podcast with just the voices of Jason and Joe. When absolutely necessary, I, the robot overlord, shall speak on James's behalf. Well, Monopoly is a, a closed world, right? It's that closed system. It, it's not that open world. It, the difference is with Monopoly, you can only do certain things and you're very limited what you can do on your turn. Where in a role-playing game, it's totally up to your imagination what you can do, whatever you can imagine within the context of the rules you can try to do. So so Monopoly, you're literally stuck on the rails. Mm -hmm. It's that track that goes around, you know, you pass go. And in a role-playing game, uh, you could say, I am going to burn down James's hotel on Boardwalk. But you can't do that in Monopoly. In D&D, &D, in Monopoly d and I can burn down James's hotel, but you can't do that in Monopoly Monopoly. So I guess it is that freedom of action. And combined with the character, did we solve this in 8 minutes and 57 seconds? Were we that good? I think we are. <laughs> I, I do think there are always going to be outliers and weird things where, you know, people are going to say, well, is this a role playing game and throw out insert example. And you'll always find some, like say, some weird outliers. But I think most games fall w would fall into what we've just said. Yeah. And that, actually, you know, I was thinking on the original definition that you gave us facilitated by Game Master. We kind of jumped on that a little bit, but I think that's legit. Even if the Game Master is the group consensus. Even if the game master is some agreed upon dice mechanic that the table agreed to before they started to play, there is still something, someone to adjudicate what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Even if it's instead of group consensus, you know, one person around the table, you know, the person who the table's left it gets to say whether or not your action was successful or the repercussions of your actions. I, I think a game master is necessary to role-playing well role-playing games yeah yeah i i would agree with that it of some sort you have to have something so, someone has to adjudicate there has to be some mechanism to adjudicate these decisions these all these open decisions we can make there has to be a way to adjudicate what happens with those in the world so i would agree with that. at this point james said that a game master wasn't strictly needed he gave the example of group cooperative storytelling games yeah, but I mean, even though that that's what I was just saying, even if you don't have someone that is called a game master, you have something that is filling that role, some sort of adjudication mechanism. Um, and so, yeah, no, I think I think it's fair. I think it's uh, I'm trying to think of an exception and the only exception I can come up with is like mythic. Uh, but in which case you're saying that the the tables and the die mechanics within mythic the game as uh, GM emulator is your GM. So you still have a game master. And even then you need to interpret what those results are. You, you, you know, you still, it still doesn't run itself. You still have to 
as a, as a human get in there and actually make sense of what you get from the tables and make them fit the situation. I, I guess we'll see what happens down the road with AI and chat GPT and all this kind of thing, whether that can actually take the role, but it's not there yet. <laughs> it's funny you say that. That was a question on uh, can Robin talk about stuff today that they address? And that was pretty much their answer right there. So I guess what we're saying, at least so far, is what makes a role-playing game a role-playing game is the role that you play, the character, a adjudicator to adjudicate the desired action of the character. Uh, Jason said it briefly, and we kind of glossed over it, but the world that the characters dwell in being a separate world that mimics reality, air quotes around reality, uh, either the reality of the fiction or as much reality as the players want to put in there of the setting versus, you know, Monopoly doesn't, I mean, has a setting, which is Atlantic City streets and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's not meant to mimic real real estate traits. Um, and uh, did I say freedom of action? Was that that one? And uh, yeah, I'll, just in case I didn't, I'll say it again. And uh, freedom of action. Here, James made the excellent point that the objective of a role-playing game is determined by the players rather than the rules. Oh, yes, that is excellent, James. And that's what you said in the beginning, where they don't may not even know what they're doing. It's the objective. The objective is not driven by the rules, but the objective objective is internal versus external. Yeah, that's awesome. That, that is a great point. Yeah, I blown away. I'm I kind of mad at myself for not coming up with that actually. And here, James made another excellent point that role-playing games also do not have a way to lose. J wow, you keep coming up with the... Just when I think we have everything, James, you keep mentioning something else. So not only do we have internal motivations rather than external motivations, but we have a lack of a losing condition as well as a lack of a winning condition. I think that's accurate. The while well, a certain module or adventure might have a win condition or a lose condition, that's only what they're doing at that point in the world. The characters still go, it provided they survive, still go on. Even if they're tossed in the dungeon, you can role play from that point on in the dungeon, whether you do an escape or whether you do whatever else. So, yeah, it's it's not a finite when you hit X, the game's over. James said that role-playing games are open-ended and continue indefinitely. Mm. Well, I, I'm going to bring up the exception, but Jason's already covered this because he said that you're always going to come up with those outliers, right? And I'm going to say a convention one-shot. It's definitely still a role-playing game. It's definitely still role-playing, but it is that you're going to do it for three to four hours and then you're done. So these are the things that I have down for what we've come up with, the, the key elements of what makes a role-playing game a role-playing game. Uh, number one, there's no winning condition. And likewise, number two, there is no losing condition. Or we could say 1A and 1B. Yeah, I like that better. Number two, that it is an open world with freedom of movement. You're not limited to going around a board. You know, you can go left, right, backwards, forwards, up, down. Uh, open decisions. You're not limited to make this move or that move. Even the games where it almost sounds like it, like I'm thinking um, Power by the Apocalypse, where you have a playbook and your moves, that's not really how those are supposed to be used. You're just supposed to say what you would do and the, the GM is supposed to decide which move that matches. And that's just to help him adjudicate it. One that, uh, I mean, number uh, one, two, whatever, four, is that uh, you have a character that you play and the character, I'm going to add something into that, is that the character is different from all the other characters. And yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. And the last thing I have is that the motivations for each player are internal. They're not put on them from the outside. It's not, yeah. So that's everything that I think we have talked about. Does anyone else have anything to add? I think the only thing to add to your points, I'm not sure if we exactly covered it. I think it's implied, but the idea that there are potentially unpredictable outcomes, whether that's, you know, some randomizer or something else, you know, for die rolls, drawing cards, whatever, and and those decisions and, and, outlaw, and things that you do need to be adjudicated somehow, and that's typically picked up by 
the game master. Uh, you need to reword that cleaner, but yeah, actually, I think I would just word that as uh, there is an adjudication method. Yeah, um, usually game master. I think we have done it. So I'm I'm just gonna bounce just in case just in case somehow I'm gonna win this argument even though I've already conceded. So with all these in mind, Jason, do you think that Boot Hill is still a role playing game? I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, so so do I. I like I said, I don't know what I was thinking. It'd been years, and I think I was just hung up on the fact that it never said that it was a role playing game. When I looked at it, it was str- strictly all I remembered was there being combat rules and almost nothing else. And I'm like. That's just a miniatures war game. It's not a, it's not a role playing game. But like I said, I looked back at it and it absolutely positively is. One thing we didn't mention is the that your characters also grow and change over the the course of play. That may be mechanically, it may be by acquiring contact and other things, but they essentially they're not this going to be the exact same. Even if it, even mechanically, if they're the same by the course of play they're going to be when it comes out in addition to that i would also say that the the world changes in response to the character's actions yeah i think that change is important though whether it's leveling up whether it's the consequences of your actions whether it's whatever whether you in traveler you you know make new contracts and can upgrade your ship whatever it is there, there, that change is happening when I was first envisioning this episode, I was going to have a section of things that it don't require that a RPG doesn't require in that, but people think it does. And I was going to say character advancement was one of them, but I was thinking strictly in a mechanical sense. But with the way that you've defined it, I absolutely 100% agree with you. And because if nothing ever changes for the character, what is the point of the activity? Why do you go down to that dungeon unless you're hoping to get treasure? wealth, experience, power, or whatever. That was an excellent one. I've added that to the list. I'm going to put this whole list into the show notes when we're done, by the way. Thank you so much for inviting me on to discuss this. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Jason. And by the way, everyone, Jason is, like I said at the top of the show, from the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. It is an excellent, excellent, excellent podcast. I'm not just saying that because he's on the show. I really believe that. I am subscribed. I listen to it religiously. In fact, I gave him a very, very long feedback on the his last episode, and he actually played the whole thing. Anyway, I will leave a link for his show in the show notes. What I love about his show is that he does what no other show I've ever listened to does, and he, he talks about popular media, movies, books, whatever, and gaming, and brings them together, just like everybody does naturally at the table, but yet his is the first show I've ever heard dedicated to it, and that was just a genius idea. Was that your idea from the beginning, Jason, did it just grow into that? That kind of was. My intent was to have, originally, was to have small segments hitting different things, you know, talk a little bit about movies, a little bit about role-playing games, a little bit about war games, a, a variety show in the classic sense, you know, from the 60s and 70s kind of thing the nerds rpg variety cast it's right there in the name but anyway yeah links are for that on the show note thanks again for joining me jason thank you audience thank you very much for listening please uh send us feedback let us know if we left anything out that you feel is needed for a role-playing game or if we added something to the list that you said you know you don't really need that for a role-playing game you can happily have a role-playing game without character change I think Jason made a very powerful argument, though, so I am going. I would probably disagree with you, but I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. And please tune in to uh, Jason's podcast if you're not already. Although I really suspect that anyone listening to our podcast has listened to Jason's podcast. But with that said, contact information is in the show notes. It's in the outro music that you are probably hearing right now. And until next week, happy life, happy gaming. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Decahedron RPG cast. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave us a voice message by calling 562-774-2278. That's 562-RPG-CAST. Or by visiting sayhi.chat slash decahedron. You can also email us at feedback at decahedron.com. Links are in the show notes. For more information, visit decahedron.com. Remember that Decahedron is spelled with a K. Music is by Kevin McLeod. Logo is by Design Cat. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep those dice rolling. Hey everyone, for the month of 
of July, I'm doing another giveaway. This time I'm giving away a copy of my favorite hard SF novel. It's kind of a classic. Actually, it's a whole series that I'm giving away. Anyway, I'm giving away one copy. All you have to do to be entered into the drawing is send feedback with your favorite hard sci-fi property. You know, it can be a movie. It can be a book. It can be a graphic novel. It can be a TV series. Whatever. Just send it in and let me know. Again, you have the entire month of July. Come August 1st, we will pick a winner. Thank you much. Bye.